Okay, thank you everyone for being here uh, for the next talk in our One World Minds seminar. Our speaker today is Mason Porter, who's a very distinguished professor uh, in mathematics at UCLA, who also has some appointment with sociology and with the Santa Fe Institute. Um, uh, like I said, very, very distinguished. I don't need to go through a list of accomplishments, recently elected to Siam, as a SIAM fellow and many, many others. But Mason, thank you so much for being here. Uh, he'll talk to us about topological data analysis of spatial systems. Please take it away. Yeah. Yeah, thanks a lot for the invitation. So I'm going to, I guess, go through some some background and some um, kind of some recent results and a little bit of ongoing stuff. Um, this version of the talk actually is somewhat adapted from uh, an hour talk on TDA that I gave at a science fiction convention. It was it was it was fun. I um there were actually parallel sessions going on on time travel during 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 the time. So, so, so it's a, it's a version of that. So I, I do have some mathematics in it as well, but, but hopefully I can bring up the background for people who have different, um, different backgrounds. Oops. Let's see if I can get my slides to advance. There we go. All right. So, um, the, the, one of the pieces of mathematics that really underlies, um, a lot of things that people are doing, um, with this approach is topology. Um, and then later on we'll, so we'll focus more algebraic topology, but I want to give a you know give a re reminder or a statement of what it is, depending on your background. And as of a couple months ago, and I don't know if this changed, but this was this was a, a little piece of the Wikipedia entry on on topology. Um, so literally, study you know place location, um, and it's concerned with properties of an object that you preserve when you do certain things to that object. Um, right. So here it says continuous deformations. There's, of course, a mathematical type of map that that would be. You say, OK, you can stretch it and you can twist it and you can crumple it and you can bend it. But what you're not allowed to do, you're not allowed to tear it. You're not allowed to glue it or do things like that. Right. So so some notion of continuous and it is the same under under that notion. Right. So the classical example are donuts and coffee cups. This is a picture of a physical demonstration of this, there's a video version of it that you can get on YouTube. This comes from um, Henry Segerman and Keenan Crane. Um, Henry Segerman, somebody who does a lot of mathematical art of various forms. Keenan Crane does things like computational geometry, um, uh, things like computer vision, actually quite a few applications. But um, so you can buy these, you can buy these in different colors. I have not bought one though I've been tempted to. Um, and you can deform them. And, and the thing that you can see is that each of these objects is one piece, right? So there's there's a number one associated with a number of pieces. And each of these objects has one hole of a certain type. Um, you do actually eventually have to worry about different types of holes. Um, and so you can deform a coffee cup to a donut and you preserve the number of pieces and you preserve the number of holes, okay? So so, so if I'm doing topology and saying that those are the types of deformations I'm doing, then, then I consider those objects to be the same because they produce the same numbers of these invariants. Okay, now things can get more complicated and, and this example, while extreme, is relevant to certain applications in this talk because if you're dealing with say geospatial data and you're looking at zip codes and so on, there is some nasty stuff. I mean, I at this point I have a paper where in the appendix, we literally have special cases of theorems because some of the zip codes in New York City have funky constructions, right? So so, so this is something that we've had to think about, though the example I'm showing you is more extreme. Um, so this is the border between Belgium and the Netherlands, and everything that's in yellow is Belgium, and everything that's beige is Netherlands. And I don't know if you can see my cursor very easily, but you know, if I imagine going here in a straight line, I'm, you know, to think of your GPS, and it's Netherlands and Belgium and Netherlands and Belgium and Netherlands again, and Belgium, and it's, like it's going through, you know, and GPS, you know, the GPS would actually do that. So that, you know, so it can get nasty. Um, and then in particular, in terms of topology, there is a sub-branch of topology known as algebraic topology. And again, this is from the Wikipedia page as screenshotted a couple months ago. It's taking ideas from algebra and it's going to study topological spaces. And so it's going to try to find invariants that you can get from some type of algebraic classification. So the number of holes is going to be somehow expressed as an algebraic invariant. The number of pieces is going to be expressed as an algebraic invariant. It classifies as topological spaces 
up to a transformation, in this case, a homeomorphism. So that means it's continuous map and continuous inverse. Um, and you can do certain types of equivalences. So there's, there's, there's some different ways of doing this. Okay, so showing this picture again, and I've verbally stated various things, right? <clears throat> so we want things that are invariant under certain types of transformations. Those are the types of things, and we'll have to, go, we'll have to make sense of how to deal with data from that, but those are the types of things that we want to compute. Um, so I've shown you examples of the first two, and I hinted at this third number of holes of different dimensions. Think of like a spherical shell, right? That is a different type of hole than this one over here because it lives a bit differently. So you have multiple types of holes. And the type of invariant we're going to be considering today are known as homological invariants, but there are other types as well. These are the, the homological invariants are ones where we, <laughs> we know efficient ways to compute them. So it's not just that topologically you have some concept, but you want something that you can also compute in an algorithmically efficient way. And the parts of algebraic topology that have been used more often when it comes to doing things with data are ones where people have come up with good algorithms to compute them quickly. Um, quickly is in the eye of the beholder, right? A numerical linear algebraist might not consider these to be quick, right? That's, so that's in the eye of the beholder. Okay, so we wanna use these ideas to somehow say something about data. And then there's, there's a mathematical theory that's built up behind it. And so there's a lot of papers that do sort of pure math type things of proving stuff about these sorts of approaches. And then there's also a matter of trying to say something about certain data sets. So I live more in the second part of that. Um, and in particular, I've been trying to take an applied mathematician's lens where we adjust the methods a bit um, based on the problem in front of us. This is something we're used to from an applied math sort of perspective. Okay, so I could show you this. This is a Pokemon. Um, it's Jigglypuff. And, you know, there's a bunch of dots. Now, the point cloud means a set of dots in a space. So, so the actual point cloud would be zero dimensional dots. And here I'm actually showing some finite radius for humans to be able to see. But we are good at looking at this and saying, oh, well, this looks like ears and this looks like feet and this looks like eyes, right? Like, like even if you're not familiar with this character, humans are good at doing this. But we, you know, we cannot just say, oh, I'm going to look at it and fill in the dots myself. We need an algorithm that somehow tells us that you've got a couple holes here in some sense and you've got a couple holes here in some sense, right? We, we need some automated way to do this. Okay, so we're trying to study the shape of data. Topology is about studying shape, and we have to somehow make sense of the fact that data has shape, right? So there's going to be some mathematical construction involved in doing that. So data could come from point clouds, like what I showed you before, or it could come from images. People have done a bunch of image processing type stuff, or it could come from videos, although that will computationally start getting harder. It could come in the form of a network, right? So, there's, so this data can come in different forms. Um, and we're doing, we're going to do something or a particular type of topological data analysis known as persistent homology, right? I mentioned homological invariance. That means invariance having to do with holes. And so this will be a mathematical formalism for studying invariance of that type. There are fast algorithms. And the word persistent, which I had not brought up earlier, this is going to be a key to how we're going to deal with how this shows up in data. Okay. And so, so the introduction, the sort of introduction part of the talk where I say, okay, how do people do this, is going to try to make sense of, of that particular word. There are lots of applications um, or lots of areas where it's been applied. I mean, you can still look through some and ask, when does it give insights that other approaches have not given? And that's a fair question. Um, for, I believe, reasons of historical accident, there have been quite a few applications in neuroscience to the point that there's even a couple review articles on TDA in neuroscience specifically. And, and, I'm, and I'm pretty sure that just has to do with individuals who happen to get into that approach and were interested in those applications. There's been a bunch on vascular networks. There's been some stuff on spreading processes, a bunch of stuff on networks in general, a bunch of stuff on granular materials. We've done some stuff with resource coverage as some others detecting political islands, structured city streets. A few of these are ones we've done. Uh, others are more common. Some references. Um, I did not actually change the references from the last. The last talk I gave was at um, in biomedicine at University of Michigan. And I, and I and I so I didn't have as many of the math references. And I it was later last night than I intended to be doing this. Um, 
partly related to baseball reasons for that. Um, and, and so I kept these references, but I can also give you more specific one, more, more um, mathematical ones. So this first paper um, is something we wrote in Physics Today, which is essentially the physics analog of the notices. So it's meant to be written for undergraduate physics majors. So it's a reasonable place to start, though it is you know, more oriented towards physics. Um, Gunnar Carlson, who's one of the big names on, on the math side in this, actually has a review article in a, in a physics journal. So that will be a little more mathematical or a lot more mathematical than this one. He wrote it in a pretty mathematical way, even though it's in a physics journal. Um, this paper here by Sizemore et al. is um, that is the um, the the one of the neuroscience um, TDA papers and is the one that I like better. There's another one that has some partly overlapping set of authors, but I like this one better. Um, if you're interested in doing this for the first time, um, Nina Otter and I and our collaborators a few years ago wrote a sort of roadmap paper. It surveys It surveys the theory and also kind of even has like supplementary information of how to install software and so on and how to guide guides people towards doing it. So if this is something you want to implement, and even though the software, of course, has changed in seven years, this paper having alongside you as you do it is is a pretty reasonable thing. And then some other sort of theoretical um, um, th th sort of more 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 theory type stuff. Um, I'm actually teaching a course on TDA right now. The book that we're using is by Tamal Day and um, Yusu Wong, D E Y and W A N G. You can find a version of this book online on I think Tamal Day's website. So you can download it for free and look at that. And that's a book of the theory underpinning it, right? So there's also some more theoretical sources if you if you want to get into these. Um, that's Cambridge University Press 2022. But again, you can get it for free uh, from, from the websites. Okay, so here's an example of a resource coverage one. We did not, we did not do this one, but I, I, I wish I had done this example. This was from a paper in a geography journal, the Geographic Information Sciences Journal. And they were doing a perspective piece trying to convince their crowd that this was a worthwhile thing to do. And 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 um, I'm showing this example for a couple of reasons. One, because it's a cute example, because it's talking about sort of pubs as resources in, um, say, Cardiff versus Manchester. So probably you want to, you know, one of the reasons to be in Manchester, I suppose. Um, and so I like the example, but also a bunch of the examples that I'm showing have had us interact with the GIS world. And so the application area that's often informed choices that we made and problems that you know, we've been thinking about and questions that we've been asking has been GIS stuff. So I was pleased to see this particular perspective piece that was written specifically in one of their journals, not just taking some GIS stuff and doing it in a math journal. Um, another example, this is by others, Bernadette Stolten Company, an example of vascular networks. Um, I'm showing a figure of theirs from their pipeline. So you have data as a bunch of blobs. You can see some structure. They have something called a filtration, which is, some, which is something I'll explain. I won't explain this particular choice of filtration, but a filtration is going to end up being the answer of how do I make sense of doing topology of data. The idea is that I pick a value of some parameter. So you can think of it as a control parameter if you want. And when I fix that value, I will tell you the topology of this structure. And then I'll fix a different value, and I will tell you the topology of this structure, and so on. And the question is, how does the topology change as I move this parameter along? So that's what's going on over here. And again, it's called a filtration or filtration parameter. And then you somehow summarize your top topological information based on that. And I'll, I'll, I'll show you a barcode at some point. I'll have to explain that. The terminology is because of what it resembles. And the parameter is on the horizontal axis. And doing it in dimension zero means I'm asking, how does the number of components change? I hear some noise. Um, doing it in dimension one means how much does the one dimensional holes change? How much do the two dimensional, these are called voids change and so on. And potentially you can have other descriptors as well. Um, you can also do this with granular materials. This is a, a picture from either the Karen Daniels lab or the or, or the Bob Berenger lab. Um, it's either one of those because Karen was a postdoc with him years ago. And so the, the materials and equipment would be very similar. Uh, and you can see some things are touching together and these bright things are when they are 
there's a high force. And so the notion that contact is an important thing is suggestive that top topological ideas are useful for these types of problems. And indeed, various ideas from persistent homology have been applied reasonably frequency to things of this type. This is quasi 2D, so the interesting actions going on in 2D. There are disks in this particular example of two sizes, and the idea is to try to figure out the structure of these things, which are called force chains or force networks. Um, there's a review article that I've co-authored on granular materials more generally. It's So it's more general than just topology, but there is a um, subsection in it that specifically up to that point discusses the topological things that have been done. So, so, so in this the context of this paper, it should be one specific section of that paper that is most relevant for, for today. Um, you can also look at spreading processes. This is another one that, um, that I was involved in. Um, and the idea is essentially I have this ring backbone, which gives you some topology. And when do I have a sort of wave front going through a ring backbone or when do I have something else? And so this paper, um, which has this enormous 50 page supplementary information, because of course it does, is, is, is about that. You can also look at city street networks. Um, this is one example from um, a paper. I'll discuss a different example from this paper later on. Um, and you want to basically say, OK, well, what does this look like? And you have a topological summary that I need to explain. I haven't done that. So LA is kind of boring, but you could also have grids that are interrupted, or you could have things that are not grid-like. Like London has all sorts of stuff going on. And to somehow use topological descriptors to say, well, what do the city streets look like? Um, in this case, this is image data. So it's an, it's an So you take an image of a part of a city. You treat that as image data, just like you did any other image data. Right. So even though the application streets were, you know, think of it as just an image. And then we see what happens. OK, so let's so I've given you some different ideas of what you might do this with um, examples geared a little bit towards my own work, but I'm giving a talk, so it's my right to do that. Um, OK, so I've shown you this picture before we squint at it. What does it look like? Humans are good at doing this. In fact, we created this dots from this image over here. And we use this. Um, we've used this plot in a or these versions of these plots in a couple of different papers now. We they debuted publicly in a paper that we wrote for teenagers and preteens about topological data analysis. Um, so if you want to show your you know your you know any kids that you have um, access to, whether it's your own or, or your friends or, or, or relatives or whatnot, you could show them this. If they have, are not able to read it and get stuff out of it, then we did not do our job. And what we're showing here is one of the figures from the from from this from this picture from this from this from this um, article. Um, so this first one is the one that I showed you, though it's smaller now. And the dots have a certain radius, and I'm increasing the radius of the dots. And so panel A, I would measure how many holes there are. There happen to be zero holes in panel A and how many components. And it's maybe a couple hundred. I'm not going to remember. And I'm certainly not going to count it. I increase the radius. And I ask, well, how many components and how many holes are there here? I increase the radius. And you know, again, humans do this before the actual topology says there's a hole here, right? Like there's a hole over here, but it's not actually yet there, right? This ear here is technically not yet a hole because there's one little opening there. You know, we know it's there, but the, the mathematics doesn't see it yet for this specific radius. And we increase them and eventually you get a giant blob. The number of pieces goes eventually stops at one if you unless you stop earlier. And the number of holes um, starts at zero because you start with points of no radius, gets larger potentially, then get smaller again, if, if you're using this type of construction, OK? And so when I'm measuring the topology of something, I'm measuring the topology of something in one panel, and I'm asking how it changes, as in this case, I change this radius, OK? So this is what happens. You know, you start with 224 pieces and no holes, um, and then eventually number of pieces becomes one, number of holes goes up, and then goes down. And the six holes that you get, two eyes, two ears, and then I would, uh, all right, well, I would struggle to figure out what the others are, and I can't do that off the top of my head, right? So, so there is also an issue of which holes are interpretable 
and which are not. Okay, this ear appears to have two holes along with it. Um, oops. Okay, so they're algorithmic methods to study potentially high dimensional data, though when we're in space, we put the data in a low dimensional ambient space that can actually help us get a bit farther. We've taken advantage of that for some of the stuff that we've done in this research. Data can come from different things. Um, oh, time series was one I didn't mention before. So data could also come from time series. We want to examine the shape of it, which means we fix a parameter value. We, we examine this and measure topological summaries of the shape of that one value. And we ask how those summaries change as we adjust the value, right? So that's how you make sense of persistence. And it's persistent if it lasts for a large number of values. You can also ask the question, well, what is large? That's a fair question. Again, topological invariance for each of these values. And persistent structure, ideally, if something lasts for many values, we are going to think of it as um, signal. If it lasts for few values, we're going to think of it as noise, right? So if I only gave you one parameter value and I say that there is one piece and six holes, well, maybe not all six of those no holes are actually features, right? Maybe some only last for small range of values. OK, so backing up a little bit, because we do need some math to actually, you know, to do this. Um, there's a notion of a K simplex. So this is a K dimensional polytope. It's a convex hull of its K plus one vertices, right? So a, uh, a point, an edge, a triangle, a tetrahedron, and so on. An M face is a subset of size M plus one as an M simplex itself. So this tetrahedron, um, the triangle is a face, the edge is a face, the point is a face, okay? So in conventional language, we might call only the triangle a face, but every subset down is still a face, okay? So we have to have that. And then a simplicial complex is a set of simplices that has to satisfy two rules. One rule is that every face is included. So this is a downward closure type of condition. The other is that the non-empty intersection of any two simplices has to be a face of both. So in particular, this is an example. This is from the Wikipedia page. This is a simplicial complex. What I am not allowed to do, you see how this entire edge, this entire edge overlaps with both simplices. I cannot have a part of an edge. It has to be the whole edge, can't be part. So that is this second condition over here. It has to be everything or nothing whenever they intersect. Okay, so this is allowed, this is not allowed. So I don't have a picture of the non-example in the slides. Okay, so we're going to use ideas from algebraic topology to analyze data. So we need what's called a filtered simplicial complex. So this Wikipedia page, S0 is a simplicial complex. I pick a value of the radius and I get one of these objects. I pick a higher value of the radius and I get one of these objects and so on. And I have this nestedness stru structure where each one um, is contained in the next one. So you can think of it as looking at a data set at different scales. And you ask yourself, again, there's a parameter that's controlling it. And you ask yourself, which structures persist across different scales? OK. This one is really weird. This blank one keeps showing up here, and it's not in the parent slide. So I don't know what the hell happens when I do this part. It's some weird thing I can't figure out. OK, this is pictures from my student, former student, Abby Hickok. You start with dots. They're technically supposed to be radius zero, but humans draw them. We have circles of some radius. And whenever there is a pairwise intersection, I would draw an edge. And whenever, again, this is a specific rule. And whenever there are three pairwise intersections, all mutually pairwise, I draw a triangle. OK, so this is not the way I've done this is not demanding all three intersect, though that's a different way of doing it. It's demanding three pairwise intersections in this choice here. And then we keep doing it. And you notice. If I look at this thing on the left, you know, I could squint and say there's a hole. And this thing on the right, there is literally a hole, right? Because topologically, this object has a hole from the intersections. OK. So this is what we did with Jigglypuff. This is, in fact, the construction we used. Do you mind if I ask this... a question? Maybe? Oh, yes, pl yeah, uh, Back to that previous picture. So this, this thing on the right, we're looking at the simplicial complex, not the blue. Thing, that's right? so that's the complex that... has two holes, right? Like, oh yeah, uh, it has a small one here. Okay. okay. It, yeah, you're right. It has a small one here. I didn't even notice that actually. Okay. But um, I this one's meant to be signal, and this one I assume is meant to be noise because okay. this was 
because this is going to fill in quickly. But but yeah, sorry, there are two holes. I hadn't even didn't even see that. But yeah, this so so the blue stuff is this underlying thing, and the simplicial complex is this red thing that is shown overlaid on the blue. Yep. Sounds good. And, Thank and you. so yep. Okay, so this is what we did with Jigglypuff. This is not the only construction, but this is like the most canonical construction. So you fix the value of epsilon, your radius. For each point in a point cloud, you center a ball of radius epsilon on that point. When they all overlap pairwise, you have a k-simplex. So this is where I was getting an edge and a triangle and tetrahedron. Um, and the resulting collection of simplices is a simplicial complex, like this wiki the picture from the Wikipedia page, but it's associated with the value of epsilon. And you look at how this changes as epsilon, and you ask how the different invariants of each one Right, so you have pairs of numbers that describe the topology of each one, and you ask how those change, and then you increment and you keep going until there's nothing interesting left, or you give up, or whatever it is. Okay, so we want to formalize the birth and death of features, which we saw visually, but there, you know, you want to make a mathematical statement. You can write down algebraic conditions for this. Um, a feature is. I'm going to write it here in English. A feature is born in the simplicial complex SI, if this is the smallest I for which a feature exists. So the minimum radius that you saw a certain hole in. I see something in the chat. Yeah, there's a question that says, do you know if TDA has been used to compare 3D shapes? Maybe application um, I think I think yes, it has. That's more of an end of talk question, to be honest. But it has. I haven't done anything with it, but that, that should be out there. Um, a Thank feature, you. yep, sure. A feature dies if it's the largest value for which it exists. So I have a radius for which it exists. I increase the radius and no longer exists. And again, you can write that down in an algebraic way. Um, some features live forever. Um, live forever could mean I'm no longer checking anymore. Yeah, there's a hand raise. Sure. Sorry, I just uh, clicked it wrong. Oh, okay, thanks. Yep. Um, and so there's various ways to summarize the births and deaths. So I showed you those before, but didn't actually explain them. And now, or I showed you two of them. There's actually many more than that. So now I want to say something, something about them. And the two that I'm going to show you, because they show up in some plots later, are persistence diagrams and barcodes. So this is called a barcode. So I showed you an example before, but didn't explain it. The left is some parameter. You can think of it as this is like the radius in this thing I was showing you, though this particular plot comes from the, the construction being very different. OK, you know, so some parameter that you're moving, whatever, whatever it is, um, and it's born at some value. So H naught means a component is born at a certain value. So you're starting with all of them there in this particular construction. And um, H1 means um, a whole, a one dimensional whole is starting at that value. And then when it's no longer there, it dies. OK, so it's called a barcode because this resembles barcodes, which I suppose the intuition of what a barcode even is, barcode is like the old fashioned version of a QR code. You still see some of them, but they're not as common. And it's just, it's called a barcode because of this thing it resembles. And visually longer features are more persistent. And that's true in the context of measuring it this way, whether that's correct for an application really depends. And that's gonna be important for some of the things that I've thought about. And this is another summary. It's actually the same information, but it's done in a different way. And this particular summary, persistence diagrams, tends to be a bit better when it comes to um, input and machine learning type stuff. Because one thing you can do is that you can put measure distance between two different persistence, persistence diagrams, which means that you can then, if I have a set of different things, I can have a set of pairwise distances, and then I can do like clustering on it, for instance. And so, a pipeline that people will have is that they'll have topological summaries of some form, some of which are more convenient for downstream tasks than others, and they will then use the downstream tasks with machine learning type stuff, right? So you see many papers that kind of combine things that way. Can I ask uh, about the, the the death of a feature, which is like H0? So that's like number of objects, right? Yes. So when, objects. when one feature dies, it necessarily has to like combine with another. Do you just arbitrarily choose one of them to continue and one? Um, yeah. And that's okay. actually, yeah. So there has to be a convention. The most common convention is the elder rule with okay. whichever one was there first. But you basically have to choose a convention to say which of them lives. Sure. 
Um, some people will write as if there's a natural choice. And I, I, I think it's honestly convention. Gotcha. Um, okay, so this particular one is again showing, this is from a different example, but, but the summary is showing the same type of information. The diagonal line, so birth time dies at, lives at 10, dies at 10. So you have to be strictly above the diagonal line the way we've defined this. So there are other ways of showing these coordinates that don't require that. And so this thing over here, all the, all the components were born at time one, the way we did this. And this one was born at time one and, or yeah, I suppose born at time one and died at time two or something. I don't know. I mean, um, yeah, I think this looks like born, at, that looks like born at time one, died at time two, um, born at time one, died at time three and so on. This was born at time three. I don't know, born at time three, died at time four, something like that. Um, okay, so we have plotting the pink circles for components, the blue squares for, 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 for one dimensional holes. This thing up here, this line is basically saying we gave up at that point. So something that's here at 22 means it didn't die before we stopped. Okay, so, so this, this should be viewed that way. Okay, so we've done this with a few things. So I'm gonna show some work with my former student, Michelle Fung. Um, their name showed up a little earlier in a couple of the things I showed. So this is from one of one of their papers. And we were looking at um, voting data, um, 2D voting data from the 2016 election. So the idea behind what we did was to try to find political islands. So islands of blue in a sea of red or islands of red in a sea of blue or possibly islands of light blue in a sea of dark blue. That is a super specific question um, and you can do it. And that's not easy to answer in a seminar anyway. Um, but yes, you can do that. You can write this down mathematically. And I think honestly, the best thing for you to do will be to look it up. Okay, that's really super specific for the middle of a talk, to be honest. Okay. Um, all right, so you can... Uh, um, find islands of blue, you know, islands of light blue and a sea of dark blue and so on. Um, now, the construction that I showed you before is actually going to run into trouble doing this. Um, one of the reasons it's going to do that, you'll notice that some of these precincts are larger than others in geographic size. And if my concern is voting islands, then I don't care about really how physically large the precinct is because that's not what I'm trying to look at. So I'm gonna to want to have a construction that works differently. And so the point of, of this paper was to try out and compare what happens with different constructions and how well they're able to produce um, these voting islands. Oops. Okay, um, this is more or less just restating what I was saying, but a hole, a 1D hole is gonna to correspond to one of these islands. And you have to worry a little bit because if I'm only taking, this is one particular county and I'm looking at precincts in counties, right? You notice that this boundary thing over here, which at some way of measuring this might matter is not gonna show up in the data, right? So this one here is not an island in the same way because of choices we made with how we're looking at data because I don't know what's going on over here in this, in, this, in this white part, right? But this one over here is an island of dark blue and a sea of light blue. Okay, so there's two ways that we did this, or the, the I mean, compared to the the uh, one of the other existing ways, and one of them we called an adjacency simplicial complex. This is the one that we thought would work better, but it will turn out to be a method that works better. But this is the one that initially our intuition made us think we're going to work better, and and it's building on the fact that the geographic size of something is not you know what's going to be relevant, but network adjacencies will be relevant. Network adjacencies would be like, you can have, you know, these two precincts are adjacent to each other, for instance. Um, okay, so if all n plus one nodes are pairwise adjacent, then you have an n simplex, right? Again, no matter how large things are, so we're not changing a radius, we're gonna change something else. And given an appropriate node data, you know, so each, each node, each precinct has to have a number attached to it, which in this case is what fraction of people say voted for Hillary Clinton. Um, 
You could also have edge data, but the, the, you know this example does not have edge data. We then construct a filtration. So we say, okay, let's keep all precincts where at least 95% of the people voted for Clinton. Then we calculate adjacencies. Then let's relax this. Let's keep all precincts, say, where 90% or more of people voted for Clinton. So now the larger set of people, right? So we're going to do this nestedness property, and you keep adjacencies. And you keep lowering your threshold. I think we, we, we did Republicans and Democrats separately. So we did 95 to 50 in one case and 95 to 50 in the other case or something like that. Um, so we actually have both red and blue oriented ones for each, for each party, um, for, each, um, for each county. Um, Okay, so, so we construct our filtration that way and it purposely does not depend on distance. So this is the one that we thought would work well. It works better than the distance-based one, but it runs into some trouble. So there's something else we did that was better. And we're at UCLA. Stan Osher is a couple doors down. Let's use level set method, right? And when I say level set here, I know the term level set comes up in other contexts in, in algebraic topology. I really mean level set front propagation, Stan Osherology, you know, that's what I what I mean. Um, so the data is now in a surface form or more properly in a manifold form. Okay, so we're taking the data in a slightly different form. And we're gonna take all map of all precincts with similar voting patterns. There is some choice of what we mean with similar. I think the way that we defined it here was saying, Similar meant that they had the majority as the same candidate, but you could make things more refined if you want to. And we consider the outer contour to be a zero level set of a 3D object, and you move things up and down. And in particular, you move things up and down by evolving the level set PD, which is this. So this is a front propagation. And you get a nestedness because the front is just moving in one direction, okay? So we're getting this nestedness from the PDE. Our filtration parameter is the time so it's the time evolution of the PDE. It's very different from what others have been done. So it's really combining, this one really is combining some UCLA centric things into how we were doing this. We also triangulated things. Um, so there's gonna be some roughness that you show that you see from triangulated things. Uh, GIS people, by the way, don't like it when you turn polygons into triangles. They're like, we made such great polygons, what are you doing? Um, and we actually found that that one worked better. We thought the adjacency one would work better, but the level set one worked better, better so Stan was happy. Um, and this is a comparison of three different ones. The alpha complex, which I have not defined for you, is related to this via torus rips complex, but is something that computationally is much faster. And the precincts that were that, that had um, larger simplicial complexes required us... Um, Via torus rips is too computationally intensive for some of those, so we did alpha for those, but it's based on distance, so you can at least partially use the prior intuition. And then we looked at the number of connected components and also the number of holes for each one. So we have the distance, this radius is the parameter for alpha, the strength of preference is the parameter for adjacency, and the time of evolution is the parameter for level set. Now, these three sets of barcodes are all totally different from each other, and they should be because the constructions are totally different from each other. But then we can look at what simplicial complexes that we ultimately get, or in, in other words, what islands we get. And we get some things from the alpha, but you know we're clearly getting a lot of other stuff that has nothing to do with this. We get do a bit better with adjacency. So some of these are actually classified correctly, and also fewer false negatives, but it's it's only partly doing it. And the level set one did the best. Now I'm showing you an example in which it just did fine. The level set one does have some issues. It does have trouble with like bodies of water, for instance. It cannot tell that a body of water is not a hole. So, so it's not that it's flawless. Um, and of course you can mark the body of water yourself, but the idea is that you don't want to do things manually, right? So, so it's a fixable problem that we know how to deal with manually, but don't know how to deal with automatically. And the paper was already 30 pages long. And so that was, you know, for some other thing. Okay, so the level set one seems to be doing well. Um, there's actually a new paper out by other people where um, I think they used the level set one only, but they were studying a different thing. This is from Lori Ziegelmeyer and company. I forgot what geographic thing they were doing, but there's now, you know, there's an additional example by others of and they used our method and our code. So you can see how well it did or did not do on, on their example. I don't remember the details of their example. But this is just out on archive a couple of weeks ago by these other folks. Okay, so I want to talk about other things too. Um, the spiders on drugs example I, I have to do. So this is this is from the same paper that has the road networks. 
And where this occurred, so there's a long story, but it started in the 1940s. There was a Swiss pharmacologist whose buddy was having trouble sleeping because spiders were spinning webs at two in the morning. Not sure what that's supposed to sound like, but he complained to his pharmacology buddy, can you give, you know, you give drugs to animals, can you give drugs to spiders, and maybe they will not spin their webs at two in the morning. So he gave drugs to spiders and looked at their webs, and the web structures were weird. And then in 1990, 1995, there's this NASA tech brief, and it's just two pages, so it's really quick to look at. They gave drugs to spiders, put them in space, and saw what webs they did. And the drug-free one is pretty normal. Caffeine spiders having problems. So this is when I cheers. Um, marijuana speed. Um, chloral hydrate is one of the things that put, gets put in sleeping pills. So you might want to worry a little bit. So we decided we can take this as image data. So it's just like the city streets for us. We take this as image data and we can look at the structure. And we just did this as a fun example, right? Because like classifying city streets and their structure is something people actually ask about. The spider web one is for us just for fun. And maybe eventually we'll get an Ig Nobel Prize. That would be very cool, but it's just for fun. Okay. So we're going to show these persistence diagrams. You can remember there's a way to actually calculate the distance between this and that. So there's a proper, technically it's a pseudometric, um, but there is a way to calculate distance. There's multiple ways to calculate distance between them. So then you can get a set of pairwise distances that you can then cluster. But in the meantime, you've got seven different things. You don't normally algorithmically cluster seven different things because if it's that small, you probably would just do it by hand anyway. But the point is still, you know, the sort of, it's an idea still, right? So you get different structures. Um, the initial condition is starting with a sort of gaps filled in and then you then you evolve the level set. So this one's using the level set complex. And you get, you know, if you do it in three groups or if you cut it off here, drug free, it's on its own and speed and chloral hydrate and caffeine are over here and marijuana peyote and LC over there. So it gives you something reasonable. Again, you wouldn't really do clustering on a seven item example, but it illustrates the point. We also show clustering on the street example where we have a few hundred of those. So that's a bit more of a serious example that's in that paper. Okay, so I wanna talk about some more recent work as well. I mean, it was on archive a couple of years ago, but the um, published version um, just came out a couple months ago. And so we're gonna go back to resource sites, but instead of being um, hubs, we're gonna think of places to vote, polling sites. Now, the thing is, the naive approach, and there's actually even some, like, um, I think, either goal or legislation that Joe Biden even did. Joe Biden said, okay, let's have everyone within five miles of a polling site. Okay, but think of five miles in East Lansing and five miles in Los Angeles. You cannot treat those as the same, right? That is not the right thing to do. You have to actually think of how much time do you take? You take time. You go there, you wait in line, you come back, right? So, so time is a more appropriate measure of cost than raw physical distance for this problem, right? Might be different for other problems, but for this problem, it's time. Um, moreover, you probably don't want to just fix one threshold and say who is within distance D. You want something where you allow it to be time. Who can vote in one hour? How many people do you get? Who is systematically disenfranchised? Who can vote in two hours? Who can vote in three hours, right? You want this parameter to be able to change and to see all of them at once and not fix a specific one. Okay, so this approach is a, an approach that allows you to do that systematically, okay? So you can look at holes in coverage at all scales, and we're also looking at entire zones that are not covered rather than point-wise. And maybe that's a little bit more arguable as to whether that's better or the same, but we, we think that's actually kind of nice as well. But but the real thing is, you know, all, all scales at once. Okay, so we're gonna measure this in terms of time. I've described this already. You have to worry a lot about data fidelity and approximations you make and so on. That was a very serious issue for this paper. And there's a limitation section that's multiple pages long to kind of one by one describe various approximations that we had to make for various reasons, including sometimes for price cost, we wanted to spend a few hundred dollars querying from Google Maps, not a few hundred thousand dollars. And that affected the sparsity of the data. And we were like, what level of sparseness can we get away with to study this problem? We do not have $500,000. We are going to use $500, right? So this was an actual, an actual choice that we needed to make for this paper. 
Then it took a year and a half to get UCLA to be willing to reimburse that five hundred dollars, but that's another story. Um, which yeah, there there are anyway. Um, okay, you have to worry about different modes of transportation, right? So if you're if you're going from one place to another, how many people have access to a car? How many have to use a bus, or so on, right? So so you do have to worry about different modes, and so there's approximations of demographic information that one might get. Um, the difference between how we do the mathematical construction, we do a weighted version of a via torus rip filtration. So like the Jigglypuff example, but what happens is that we use this waiting time. So if my waiting time is an hour at a certain spot, I don't start growing the ball at that point until an hour has passed. So the radius is zero until an hour and then it goes. So you have to get past the waiting time before the ball grows. And so a ball in different spots can grow, can start growing at a different point. This is not the only way to handle this, but this was the way we chose to do it. Um, for waiting time estimates, we assumed that everything in each district was the same, and we had to because that's the only access to the data we had. So if there are 10 precincts in a district, those 10 precincts for us have the same waiting time. I know that's not correct, but this is the data that we had, or data we could get. There's a certain paper that published this data. Okay, now the other thing that's relevant, um, the topological summary that makes sense for this application. So again, this is more the applied math type of um, mentality that comes in. The topological summary that makes sense here is not the same as before. We actually don't care about birth time very much. We only really care about death time. A death time of 80 minutes says that you can definitely vote in 80 minutes. A death time of two hours says you can definitely vote in two hours. So I don't care how long it lasted, I care if it takes two hours for you to vote, okay? So we were measuring something different because the application dictated that something different was more relevant. We did six different cities. Technically for LA, we did LA County. Um, here is a comparison between Atlanta and Chicago. So this is one of the pictures from the paper. And what you can see is that systematically a larger fraction or, you know, got, this is, so this is basically a probability or an empirical probability distribution. Um, the larger fraction of things, Atlanta is shifted to the right. So there's more places in Atlanta where it takes longer to vote. Atlanta was actually one of the motivating city behind this project. Stacey Abrams was making some comments and so on. So, so we knew in advance that Atlanta was going to have problems. Um, right. So Atlanta is doing a lot worse. Um, this is for this is for zero dimensions. So this is saying two spots, and do I have a hole in between? or a hole in between since it's connected components. And this one's saying in one dimension, three spots, do I have a hole in between, right? So Atlanta is very far to the right of Chicago, noticeably in both cases. Um, we One of the current projects that we're doing, so this is, this is, we don't have a paper for this one yet. You can do other resources as well, and not all of them are gonna have relevance of waiting times, right? So like if I think of coverage of parks and we're doing Chicago because Chicago is, um, civic website, the city website has a lot of very rich data available. Chicago has actually been very good about this. So it's not that we care about Chicago in particular. They've just been much better than most cities about making rich, usable data publicly available. Okay. So that's why Chicago. Um, so you can look at different parks. Now, the thing is, waiting time probably is not a problem. You probably want to be there. But parks are not just parks, right? Like I might say that a polling site each one is the same. I mean, that's not exactly true, but to a reasonable approximation, it's re it's it's true, and I probably wouldn't have information to any discrepancies anyway. But you know, some parks might have, say, a merry-go-round, and others might not, or some parks might have other things, and others might not, or it might have larger acreage or whatever. So you have a scalar value associated with a park, and that value could come from anything, and it's a kind of it's a research topic in its own right of saying how should I have a scalar value? The mathematical problem is that I have a scalar value. And of course, we're writing our code in a way that if you wanted to do a different scalar value than we did, you know, just insert it there. So we'll show a couple different ones when we write the paper, but this might be acreage and special features. Number of stars is like the, um, whatever the park version of Yelp is, right? These are ratings that people gave on websites. And that's one of the ones that you should definitely do anyway, because that's what people actually look at when they make decisions, regardless of whether you think the value is good or not, right? Because people are actually using it. Um, 
And so then you have a quality score. So now you have two parameters. You have this distance type cost or, or travel time or whatever, and you also have a score. So you now have a filtration with two parameters, which I haven't told you about before. You lose one of the mathematical guarantees. There's a certain module of decomposition that you lose, which means that there's some trickiness mathematically of how you're going to handle it. It's called a, a bifiltration or a multi-parameter filtration, in this case, two parameters. So one of the reasons we're doing parks as this follow-up example is because of the fact that we have this scalar value at the points that we're now dealing with things in a different way, right? So slightly different example. So we're currently working on that. There is a paper in progress. I would say at this point, early 2025 is when you'll see it on archive. We wanted it up for this fall because of um, job application implications for some co-authors. Um, at this point, since we're almost at November, I think we're talking early 2025, but it will be there, so watch out for it. Okay, so some conclusions. Um, so there's a general thing called topological data analysis. I've actually shown you something more specific. I've spent my time on persistent homo <laughs> homology. There are other types, but this is the most popular type by far because it's the one where people have been able to make the most advances on making algorithms fast enough to do stuff. So, the, so it's because these types of invariants you can compute, I'll say relatively quickly, because I know if you're from computational linear algebra and so on, it will not seem quick in comparison to that, but it's much faster in comparison to other topological things. And it can give insight into both structure and dynamics and spatial systems. So I've shown some examples and you know, hopefully convinced you that it's an interesting to do for these sorts of projects. Um, so I've, I've spent a lot of time on spatial and spatial temporal data. Actually, I didn't show you the spatial temporal data one so much. We have a paper on um, spatial temporal patterns with, with COVID infections that, that's not in these slides, but it's part of the sequence of work. Um, and then the applied math mentality, which is a way that we've been pro approaching it that I think is different from what even many of the most of the applied TDA people do is that we incorporate information from applications into it. So when we're constructing these objects, we are thinking about things in the context of what makes sense for the application, not just doing a standard construction because it's there, right? So we've really, that's something we've really spent a lot of time thinking about. And with each problem, we all, we ask ourselves, well, what is the question, what is a question that's actually relevant to ask about that problem and what construction can, can help us say something about it? Okay, and so with that, I will conclude. Um, I know there were some questions. I hope, hopefully there'll be some more.